everyone and welcome to our online services. It is so great to see you here, even if it is through a camera, we are so glad that you've joined us. I just want to encourage you, um, wherever you are in your homes, to just raise your voices together with us as we bring some worship to our God. that we have just sung praise the father praise the son praise the spirit three in one the apostle peter he he writes these words to to churches that were 
struggling, going through a, a season of trials and persecution. And he, and he writes these words, because of the new birth that we have, we've been given new birth into a living hope. We have a living hope through the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead. What hope we have because of Jesus. And, and we, we are people who have been rescued. We've been people who have been redeemed. And, and that's a great hope that we have as God's people. My name is James. I'm the pastor here at Toon Gabby Baptist Church. And I want to welcome you all to our 10 a.m. online service. It's wonderful to have you join us at this time. Now, I want to especially welcome those of you who are watching for the first time. Or if you're watching for the second time and you're a newcomer uh, and you've been joining us over the last couple of weeks, what I want you to do is please connect with us. Up in the right-hand top column on the web browser, you can connect with us. Give us your details. We would love to know that you've been watching us online. Today, uh, we've got a variety of things going to happen. We're going to pray. We're going to watch a video. We're going to have a guest speaker who's going to come and open up from the Gospel of John, chapter 20. But before we do that, there's a variety of things I just want to give you a quick update with. I want to let you know about our online services. Next Sunday at our 10 a.m. and our 5.30 p.m. service, we're going to do that online, even if the restrictions ease. We want to give you a comfort of mind. We're not sure whether next Friday the, the New South Wales Greater Sydney lockdown will be released or not. So next Sunday, we're still going to do this online. So please join us if you're a regular at 10 o'clock or if you're a regular at 5.30, please join us on this format. But also, I want to encourage you, after the service online, jump on to Zoom Morning Tea, where we can connect and see each other face to face. I would love you to join us via Zoom. But now, please, um, we're going to have quiz works. Get the kids to come. Get their colouring in sheets ready and let's watch another quiz work story about Jesus. Hi everyone, you I'm... You can't, because it's my bat and it's my ball and you know what? You're not even my friend anymore! <laughs> oh, hi Percival. Oh no, yeah, hi Miriam. <sighs> What's going on? Oh, you know, it's only Scruff and Chick and Bubbles and Reg and Jazz and... Uh-huh. Ah! Oh, <sighs> right. Well, I mean, we were playing with my bat and my ball, mm -hmm. but they weren't playing by the rules. Aww. Yeah, yeah, and, and I do not play with anyone who doesn't play by the rules. So what I'm going to do, Miriam, yeah. is I'm going to take my bat and my ball... And I'm gonna go home. Ma! <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry about that. As I was saying, I'm Miriam, and that was Percival. Well, today we are going to be looking at a true story from the Bible about what happened when a good and religious person met Jesus. But first, let's meet a person called Rudiger. This is Rudiger. And Rudiger was a very good person. At school, Rudiger would always help his teacher with anything they needed. Can I carry, oh, I'm going to carry your bag. And I'm going to carry this, and I'm going to carry this bag as well. I'm going to help you. Okay, I'm going to help you. I'll, I'll just, I'll take these over here. Yeah. And whenever there was a test on at school, Rudiger would always get top marks. Rhinoceros. R-H-I-N. O C E R O S. Rhinoceros. And Rudiger would even help all the other children. You see, it's spelled R H I N, not just R I N. The H is silent. And Rudiger used to help old ladies across the street. Oh, do you need help? Do you need help, old lady? I'll I'll help you as you as you walk down here. You're doing you're doing so well. Well done. Well done. And at church, Rudiger knew all the answers. Oh, oh, oh! Well, the answer is Jesus. Or it's God. And if it's not Jesus or God, then it's definitely the Bible. Rudiger was a very good person. The end. Maybe you sometimes feel like Rudiger. Maybe sometimes you feel like you're a pretty good person. You always do your best and your best is pretty good. 
Well, today we're going to hear about what happened when Jesus met a man named Nicodemus, who was a good and religious person. <laughs> okay, Miriam, I'm back. So yep. I see, uh -huh. <laughs> everyone, this is my friend Percival. Oh, hi, everybody. I am Percival. Well, you seemed pretty upset before. Yes, Miriam. Yes, I was very upset before. And you know why? Why? Well, because me and my friends were playing, but I was the only one playing by the rules. Aww. Everyone else was cheating. And so, they're not my friends anymore. Oh, no. Anyway, Miriam, what are you up to? We are about to watch a true story of what happens when Jesus met someone who was a good guy. A good guy? Yeah. Hey, he sounds like my kind of fella. <laughs> yeah, I bet that Jesus shook his hand and said, congratulations, son, for being such a top bloke. <laughs> well, how about we see, hey? How can people be made right with God? Maybe by being good? Maybe by being religious. Do these things make you right with God? Can we be good enough for God? Nick walked as fast as his old frame would allow. It was dark out and he wanted to get to the house where Jesus was staying as quickly as he could. He saw the light shining from the window. He knocked and waited as he heard footsteps approach. The door swung open and light poured out. Nick the teacher of God's law, sat in silence, wondering how this discussion would go. Opposite him sat Jesus. Jesus was much younger than Nick, but already he was known as someone who taught about God with great authority. Nick also heard that Jesus had great power. Jesus had turned water into wine. Jesus made people who were blind able to see again. Jesus healed people whose legs did not work. Jesus had great power indeed. Finally, Nick spoke. Jesus, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. No one would be able to do the miracles you are doing if God were not with him. Surely this compliment would please Jesus. But as Jesus looked at Nick, he knew that Nick had to change. He knew that his being good was not enough. And so Jesus said to Nick, I tell you the truth. If you want to see God's kingdom, you must be born again. You must be born again? That caught Nick's attention. How can I be born again? Thought Nick. He looked at himself and imagined. Could he fit back inside his mum and be born a second time? Surely not then what could Jesus mean? Did Jesus mean that all the good and religious things that Nick did would not be enough? That Nick would have to be changed completely by God to be made right with God? Jesus went on to say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life in his name. A short time later, Jesus, God's only son, was killed on a cross. This is what had to be done for people to be made right with God. But to show that Jesus could offer eternal life for all who would believe in his name, three days later, Jesus was raised back to life again. And so, how can people be made right with God? It's not by being good or by being religious. People need to be changed completely by God to be made right with God. And people are made right with God by believing in Jesus' name. The end. What just happened? Well, what do you mean? Well, Nick was a good and religious guy. Yeah. But that wasn't enough to be right with God? Well, that's what Jesus was saying. <gasps> the Bible says that by themselves, no one can be good enough to be made right with God. Why not? Well, because if we think about it, none of us can live up to even our own standards, never mind God's standards. What are you talking about, Miriam? I do. Uh, 
really? Mm -hmm. So you're happy to shout at your friends and oh. tell them that you won't be their friend anymore just oh. because they did something that annoyed you a little bit. Oh. Miriam, there is no way, no way that I would ever do... Oh, wait, uh, that's what I did, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, you did. Oh, man, I can't even live up to my own standards. No, <laughs> when we think carefully about it, none of us do. Oh, this is hopeless, Miriam! But <sighs> no, it's not. Because it's not. Jesus taught that if people recognise that they need to be changed by God... Yeah to be made right with God, mm -hmm. then that can happen. If people believe in Jesus, God will allow people to be made right with him. Oh. And he will give us new life. Wow. And with that new life, we will still not always get things right, mm. but we can try to live more like the way God wants us to, with his help. Oh, that is great news, Miriam. And you know what I'm going to do? What? Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to get my ball <laughs> and my bat and I'm going to say sorry to my oh. friends, Miriam. Yeah, hopefully they're going to want to play with me again. Oh, that sounds like a really good idea, Percival. Yeah, okay. <laughs> See you later, Miriam. <laughs> <laughs> See you. <laughs> well, today we have seen from the Bible that everyone, even really good people, have to be changed by God, to be made right with God. Everyone has to believe in Jesus to be made right with God. To help you think more about that, we have some discussion questions and activity sheets and games and craft ideas that you can check out at www.quizworks.com forward slash home delivery. And you can talk to people you know who do believe in Jesus. And you can ask them what it means for them to believe in Jesus. Now, I'm going to go and see if Percival will let me play as well. I'll see you next time. This week we were reminded of the priority of prayer, that we are to live with a priority of prayer and we're to live with shameless audacity. So. Why don't we do that now? We're going to pray. So please join me as we pray to our great God. Heavenly Father, you are our Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Our greatest treasure of our longing soul. True delight, true life is found in you alone. We are so grateful that we can pray to you. We are so grateful that you incline your ear to hear our prayers. Father, we don't deserve your attention, and yet in your grace and your mercy, you hear us, and you answer us according to your perfect character. You have answered our pleas for mercy, and you have given us new life in Christ. A in, in a world that is changing so fast, you are never changing. You are the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And in this great truth, we can find rest and comfort. Father, we want to praise you and thank you for the gift of prayer. Thank you, thank you that you've made a way for us to call out to you, to give thanks, in a way that we can also call out to you with our pleas and our concerns. Thank you for inviting us to pray in all times and in all seasons and in all trials. Father, we pray that we will be a people marked by prayer. We ask that you would help us to be people who love to pray. May we be people who are quick to remember you in every moment, not only when times are hard. Lord, help us to remember you and to pray to you in every triumph and every trial, in every joy and in every sadness, in every season of life. And yet, Father, we often stray from prayer. We confess that we often move away from it. We're, we're faithful for a season and then it drifts. And so I pray that you'll forgive us of our prayerlessness. Forgive us from becoming lazy and unconcerned with our spiritual communion with you. Forgive us for giving up so easily and not even caring. May we be a people of prayer and dependence on you, bringing everything before you in prayer. Father, we pray that we'll be a people who delight in Jesus. Father, may we treasure him. May we sit 
at his feet and to absorb his teaching. Father, we're thankful for your word that helps us listen to you, to know you better. Thank you that it gives us truth for every second of every day. And Father, we pray now that you'll open up our hearts, open up our minds, take away the distractions of this day so that as Graham comes to us shortly and opens up your words, that we will be ready to hear and to act, to delight and to praise you because of who you are. Almighty God, we want to be a church that makes and grows disciples of Jesus. Father, help us to get on with gospel ministry. Help us to be growing men and women and boys and girls and sending them so that we all know that we are all sent into this world. Help us to weigh up the cost of this, but to delight in doing this. Father, we desire to see your kingdom come. Lord, bring it in. Father, we pray that your glory will be known. And Father, we pray this through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, Agnes, it's great to have you here with us. Um, I'm going to interview a little bit more about a book that we shared last week called Family Discipleship. Last week, we heard from you what family discipleship is. And put simply, family, family discipleship is leading your home by doing whatever you can whenever you can, to help your family become friends and followers of Jesus Christ. And today, I'm going to share a little bit more about the impact of this book and what it means to model. But before we ask you that question, just want to let you know that last week at our 10 a.m. service, the Tomars got one a copy, and at the evening service, the Corrigans got one as well. And what I want to encourage you is we've got more to give away today. So get ready in the chat bar for when we finish this interview, and maybe you could win a copy as well. So Agnes, we're going to talk about modelling today, but before we talk about modelling, I just want to probably just you know, let you know, now if you're retired, if you're 50 and you don't have kids at home, or if you're single, I encourage you don't tap out, but continue to listen, because as Christians, we're in this all together, and it's a beautiful thing to see people who are single, to see grandparents or retired people model what it means to be disciples of Jesus. So, Agnes, yep. what, what is modeling um, in family discipleship? Yeah, modeling is one of the four components this book speaks about family discipleship. So family discipleship modeling is serving as a godly example to our family by uh, living a godly, uh, closer walk with God and by demonstrating true repentance when uh, we fall short. Um, so this aspect focuses more on our own soul as parents. So uh, focusing on uh, our journey with the Lord. So unless our time with the Lord is good and that uh, our um, relationship with God is good, how can we authentically lead family discipleship for our family, right? So um, Paul says in 2 Timothy that train yourself to godliness. Unless we train ourselves to godliness, how can I train my children to godliness? Unless, and if I want to see an attribute or a character, godly characteristics to form in my child, uh, it sh I should pray that it should be for first formed in me so that I can model that to my child. Unless, if I want my um, uh, Andrina, my daughter, to be saturated in God's word and look to God's word for her um, guidance, um, how can she do that unless she sees me saturating in God's word? If she's going to see me all the time with my phone or watching Netflix at home, how can uh, she how can she look up to me as a role model or how will she know how to be saturated in God's word so uh, this is the it's, it's a soul um, it, it's a great uh, topic which searches your own soul and it's been doing a lot of work in my heart and my husband's heart this week yeah, that's wonderful mm. and so, so modeling it's actually soul searching mm. so we're talking about modeling what are what are the components mm. to family discipleship in modeling yeah there are two components um, to the family discipleship modeling. Uh, one is being reliable. The other one is being relatable. Being reliable, having um, repented in integrity, powerful words, and being relatable by being uh, by having relatable proximity. So uh, when I, when we say proximity, it's not. Uh, just being in the same room or same car. It is not just spending time around the kids. It is being actively involved in the life of our children and opening our hearts, uh, our lives, so that our having through a loving relationship, allowing the children to see who we really are. 
and this is also being vulnerable enough for our children to see us how we make choices how we handle failures um how we overcome when we um our mistakes and how we look into god's word for our growth our edification and um for rebuilding ourselves so it's really a very hard place to be um to allow our children to see how we repent so this has been uh when i read this book this has been a mind blowing and i opener for me that i need to model repentance to my children so it's it's, it's it sounds like this is just mm. really it's just blown you away yeah. reading this book with mm. yourself and your husband mm. and you talk about being vulnerable could you give us give us a quick example of yeah. what 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 are your what that looks like yeah a while ago i was um having a conversation with my uh, son andrick 10 year old um we were talking about how to overcome a temptation and how to practice self control and how with god's help we can do that and he, this was a, one of those deep gospel conversation moment and he he was um just um into the conversation and he felt how helpless we are as human beings but then he made a, a comment saying but mummy it's not hard for you you're holy you're pure you're godly and you don't sin at all uh, and um i laughed it out and then i tried to explain saying even i face uh, a lot of temptation and with god's help with the help of the holy spirit i overcome it and secretly um within me i was happy that uh, my son could see me as such a great role model and i was proud i thought i was doing it right but when i read this book it came um uh, so powerfully it was convicting me that i hadn't given a chance to my son to see how Uh, I repent that I am a sinner too in need of God's grace and I need his grace every day. So if I don't model that to my son to my daughter how are they going to learn repenting? So h- how can I um expect them to repent for their sins if they don't see me doing it? So in the last week um this is a real bold step um uh, I had always realized that when I pray in our family prayers I leave the confession part out of the prayer and I keep it for my personal prayer time because uh that's between me and God. Yeah, well I do sometimes with my husband but not before my children. But this week um I started doing that in our family prayer. I confessed a few of my sins and like a fire it caught on my children. They started making those kind of prayers. So that's a, this week has been a great a week of uh, practicing what i've learned and what me and my husband have been talking about. Ah, uh, thanks so yeah. much um Agnes for sharing. It's just mm. so powerful to see parents mm. model repentance to their kids and it's it's powerful to see people even in the church model mm. repentance to to their friends and their brothers and sisters in yeah. Christ. So thanks for sharing. You're going to share next week again on the next um stage of family discipleship. Yeah. So Okay, get on the chat bar. Let us know. We've got two more to give away today, and we'd love to give heaps of these away and encourage you to read it. Thanks, yeah. Agnes, for joining Thank us. Thank you. Good day, Graham. It's great to have you here with us uh, today online with us. Thank you for coming, and you're going to open up God's Word for us from yep. the, the Gospel of John. But probably for most people watching online, they have probably got no idea who you are. So it'd be helpful for you just to yeah, just share a couple of things about yourself, um, sure. your life. You know, are you married? Yep. Yep. So I'm Graham. Married to Alison, we have three kids. Uh, now I've got to think about their ages to get it right. Uh, oh, 21, 19 and 14. So two of them living at home with us and the other one studying in Canberra. That's great, Graham. And so Graham, now you're a tradie. What trade I did was. you do? Yeah, so when I left school, I got a job at Bankstown Airport and I was a fitter. So we made aeroplanes. It was a lot of fun. I also made trains for a while. Yeah, that was cool too. That's great. Yeah. But you're here today. You're going to have God's word. So yes. going from being a fitter to where you are today, something's happened. You've been <laughs> to Bible college. You've studied. Yeah. You've been overseas. Yes, that's missionary. right. Yeah. Where, yeah. Whereabouts were you missionary overseas for, and how long? Yeah. So we lived in the Middle East for eleven or twelve years. You know, spent a while studying Arabic, and then looked after an international church and got involved in all sorts of things in that country. It was interesting. That's it. Yeah. And then when you came back to Australia, what did you, yeah. what did you do in Australia when you came back? So I lived in Townsville for a while as part of a church there, lived in Melbourne for a while, again looking after a church there and working for a missionary organization for a while and now teaching mission at Morling College. And that's where, that's where we met. I I was able to sit under you in one of the lectures. I think it was missional hermeneutics. That's right. And so you're a lecturer, you're going to come and open up God's word for us today. Yeah. But what do you love about teaching the Bible? 
I just like it when people get hold of what's happening. So you can see it sometimes in their eyes. So a lot of people, they grow up in church and they've got sort of a story here and a story there and a story somewhere else. And they, that's great. That's a good start. And they come to Bible college and that's the time where they sit down and they begin to get it all in order and see that God has a plan, which is what we call mission. That's a big picture of what God is doing. So a good, a good day for me is any day where somebody understands what God is doing in the world and then how they fit into that. That's a really good thing. So that's what I'm aiming for. Uh, say at last semester, at the end of the semester, one of the students said to me, oh, you know, at the beginning of the year I thought, Oh, I'd have to give up everything I liked and everything I enjoyed to be part of mission. And I just have to accept that I'm going to hate my life forever. But now I realize that God has made me a certain way and I'm interested in certain things and I'm really good at certain things and, and God can use them for his mission. So she's a, she's a vet nurse by profession. She loves animals, even cats. Who'd have thought? But anyway, you know, God makes all sorts of people. So she loves cats and dogs and, and she sees now how she can use that for mission in all sorts of different ways. So it's just really exciting to see her discover that. Yeah. Really yeah. good. And I really enjoyed sitting under um, your lectures and learning about mission and hermeneutics and yeah. just seeing mission throughout the Bible. And yeah. um, I want to thank you, though. Thanks for coming. And, and you're going to open up God's Word for us. You're going to read right. it to us. So I want people to grab the Gospel of John and turn to John chapter 20. That's right. And, and you'll read it for us in a few moments. Thanks, thank you. Dave. Thanks, James. We're going to read from the Bible. So if you've got your Bible there, uh, have a look at John chapter 20. So John chapter 20 and reading from verse 9 to verse 23, verse 19 to verse 23. John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So we're going to open up the Gospel of John this morning and look at John chapter 20. James asked me to come along and do a sermon on mission. And, and when people ask me to do that, it's often, I don't quite know what to say because the, the tricky thing is that the word mission isn't actually in the Bible. And that might come as a bit of a surprise to some of you. Perhaps you're thinking, hang on a minute, how can the word mission not be in the Bible? But think about it. Can you think of a verse with the word mission in it? There are a few, you know, back in the Old Testament, David's men get sent on a mission And depending on what version of the English Bible you read, then there's maybe one verse in the book of Acts that has the word mission in it. But actually the word isn't used very much in the Bible. And that's a bit weird because we write books about mission and we have conferences about mission. And and as I'm recording this sermon, there's a Baptist in Mission conference on this afternoon. We have committees for it and all sorts of things about it. But the word's not there. I'm not too worried about that for a couple of reasons. One is that the, the, the main reason the word's not there is because it hadn't been invented when the Bible was written. So the word mission it actually comes from Latin and Latin hadn't been invented so it didn't get a mention in the Bible because it wasn't a word they used then. So I'm not too worried that it's not there. Secondly, the idea is everywhere. The idea of mission goes from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22 and is on pretty much every page in between those two. So the idea of mission is there, because mission really means sent. That's the word, what we're going to talk about today, being sent. And the third reason I don't mind actually not talking about mission is because I think, and I could be wrong, but I think there's a lot of people in the back of their minds, when they hear mission, they think, something somebody else does somewhere else, but not me. Mission is you know, for missionaries who go somewhere else, but it's not for me. I reckon there's a few people who probably think that in the back of their mind. Whenever they hear about the word mission, they they think, oh, yeah, I can pray. Oh, yeah, probably better get my wallet out. Somebody's going to ask me for money in a minute. The word mission just got mentioned. But other than that, they think that's something someone else does. Well, I hope today that by the time we finish looking at that part of John, you'll agree with me that that's not quite the way God thinks. That being sent, which is really the idea behind the word mission, 
is actually something that all of us are. So have a look with me at John chapter 20, starting at verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week. So this is, this is actually Easter Sunday in the evening. So what's happened before this is Good Friday, obviously. No prize for guessing that Jesus died on Good Friday. They've had Saturday. Now Sunday has happened. Sunday morning, you might remember that in the Gospel of John, two of the disciples go to the tomb. They see the empty tomb, but they don't really understand what it means. They're kind of puzzled by it. And then Mary, she does see the risen Lord. And that's amazing. That's profound. She has this wonderful encounter with him. She goes back to tell the other disciples, but still they, they just can't really put it together. Of course, we have the advantage of knowing the full story. So we think that we're slightly cleverer than them, but really we're not. I'm sure if I, we were in their position, we'd be in the same muddle that they were. What's going on here? We saw Jesus die, but the body's gone. And Mary says that. So that's what happened before this story, right before this story. And then after this story, that's the famous bit where Thomas turns up uh, late to the party, as it were, and asks to stick his finger in Jesus' hands and in his side. So that's, this is where we are when we come to this story. It's, it's Sunday, Easter Sunday. The Lord has risen, and this is his very first appearance to the disciples all gathered together. And I think it's worth noting that in verse 19, it is the disciples there. So it's not like it's just the apostles so all, all that follows from here, all that comes out of this, is not for some, you know, specially chosen Olympic squad of Christians, some uh, elite green berets or whatever commandos, you know, some, some other level of Christianity. What comes after this, what Jesus says and does now, is for all of the disciples, all of us normal, boring, common or garden Christians. So the disciples are together and the doors are locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Now, as we mentioned before, we lived in the Middle East for a while and it had its moments, you might say. At one point, uh, you know, the government decided that people were getting a bit uppity and so they decided to start rounding up people they disagreed with. And that's pretty disconcerting when that begins to happen. People started to disappear off the streets and at first it was people we didn't know and then it was friends of people we knew and then it was people we knew and then it just kept coming closer to us and you start to think, hang on a minute, is my name on a list somewhere? You know, it's just like creeping up on you. And so I've got a lot of sympathy for the disciples because we, we were in this position for, for a while. They were afraid. Jesus had died just 48 hours ago, more or less. And perhaps they're thinking, well, who's next on the list? You know, have the Romans got some kind of plan? Are we going to be rounded up as well? It's quite a reasonable assumption i reckon and it's pretty disconcerting living like that so they were afraid the doors were locked and i don't blame them i i understand what that was like and i think in, in some ways a, a certain level of fear is normal and a certain level of fear is necessary for life if you weren't ever afraid of anything you'd probably have been run over by a bus years ago and the, when you tried to cross the road and you didn't move fast enough so the disciples were together just all the christians together the doors were locked and they are afraid. Jesus comes and he stands among them and says, Peace be with you. Which is obviously a bit of a shock for a number of reasons. One is that, you know, Jesus was dead. So that's a bit of a surprise that he's not dead anymore. And secondly, that he somehow managed to appear inside the room be behind the locked doors. So that's pretty shocking and pretty surprising and pretty overwhelming. The disciples are overwhelmed with joy. Jesus says, peace be with you. Now, in that part of the world, which is not far from the part of the world that we used to live, uh, peace be with you is just a normal thing that you say. Like when you walk into a room, you, you, you literally say, peace be with you, and everybody replies, and also with you, sort of words to that effect. So everybody says that, and I guess probably most people don't think about it very much. It's just that kind of the thing that everybody says. But you know how sometimes... When you say to somebody, oh, good morning, how are you? We sort of expect that people will say, good, 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 good. And don't really expect that people will actually tell you how they are. Every now and again, that's a bit of a shock when somebody says that. You know, good morning, how are you? Well, let me tell you how I am. So I don't know if there's anybody in this particular church, but we used to have in one of our churches a lady named, well, I won't tell you her name, we'll call her Elizabeth. 
she was an older lady and she had a few complaints. And so every morning I'd be, you know, welcoming people at the door and say, good morning, Elizabeth, how are you? Oh, Graham, me bowels, me bowels. She was pretty deaf, so she'd say that in a loud voice and she'd actually tell you how she was. She had a lot of bowel problems. And it was a bit, oh, well, everybody knew her and, and they loved her and they kind of got used to it. But it was perhaps a bit unusual for new people coming in and hearing that story being repeated. And so we do that, don't we? We say, good morning, how are you? We don't think about too much. And I, I reckon this is what's happening here in this pa passage. Jesus says, peace be with you. And the disciples sort of don't get that. And so he has to say it again. Did you notice he said it twice? Because this idea of peace is actually a really important idea. On the one hand, it is the common greeting. But on the other hand, it's actually something that's really important in the Old Testament. And Jesus, I think, wants them to pay attention to what he's saying because he's bringing all that Old Testament stuff with him into this moment. So, for example, in the Old Testament, you might remember a story of a, a prophet named Samuel and a lady named Hannah, and she had a particular prayer for something that was really on her mind. And Samuel told her her prayer was going to be answered, and he said, go, you know, go in peace. So when we think about peace, we think about not war. There's peace, which is the same as not war. They're the two opposite things that are sort of equal to each other. But here, when Jesus says peace, there's more to it than that. Like when Samuel said to Hannah, peace be with you, he didn't mean, you know, not war be with you, because that wouldn't make any sense to Hannah. He meant, well, what did he mean? Something like confidence, something like assurance, that God had heard her prayer and would answer it. Something like settledness, if that's a word. It is in the language we learned, and it took me ages to learn that word, so I use it all the time now. Settledness, calm, confidence, assurance, that sort of thing. And the idea of peace comes up over and over in the Old Testament. It talks about a state of heart or mind in Isaiah chapter 26. Again, in the book of Isaiah, sin, the forgiveness of sin and peace are the same thing. So we think peace is not war, but actually peace is also the forgiveness of sin. And when you get the word peace and you look at it through the whole Old Testament, which is kind of one of the things that you do at Bible college, then you see that there's so much more to it than our sort of English understanding of that world. It's, it's, about, it's about how everything's connected, everything's working well, everything's in the right place and rightly relating to each other. You could almost replace it with a word like, like flourishing, for example, or harmony, which sounds a bit new agey. But it's actually not far off what the meaning of the original word peace is. So here are these people, right? They're afraid because Jesus has died. And twice he says to them, peace be with you. And I reckon that's a deliberate thing, bringing with it all the hopes of the prophets and the people of the Old Testament into that situation. To anxious and troubled people, Jesus appears and says, peace. Now I reckon that's, not that far off where some of us are at today. Okay, we're not at war, that's true, and we're very grateful for that. But on the other hand, there's not a lot of settledness around, is there? There's a lot of unsettledness. Um, things change from day to day now, don't they? Can we go here? Can we go there? Can we have this gathering? Can we not have it? Every day is a different story. Every day we watch the numbers. How many is it today? How many is it today? And it leaves people, well, not peaceful, that's for sure unsettled really disturbed and so maybe you're listening to this today and the reason god's got you listening to this is just so that you can be reminded that jesus brings peace that's not the main point of this passage and at least that's not the main point i want to bring out but maybe there's some people listening and watching at home who just need to be reminded and to take a minute to think and re remind themselves that Jesus brings peace. The resurrected Jesus brings peace to his troubled and confused disciples. He also brings joy. See that in verse 20. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now, to be honest, I'm not very good at joy. Uh, I don't know why. Maybe it's my Anglo thing, like, you know, the whole English stiff upper lip sort of thing. You don't get too excited about anything, not too happy, not too sad. It's just, you know, maintain an even expression all the time. So I'm not really very good at joy. Uh, in different parts of the world, we've noticed that, that different people seem to be much better at this than at least I am. 
So maybe this is something I've got to learn yet, I reckon. I reckon I've got things to learn about joy. And perhaps I, to learn them from people from other cultures. So Jesus brought peace and he brought joy. I kind of understand peace, but I'm still working on the joy. And then Jesus says, As the Father sent me, so I am sending you, in verse 21. So it repeats again, Peace be with you, which we've already talked about. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. So the idea, like I said before, the word mission doesn't get much of a mention in the Bible, but the idea of sending is all over the place, especially in the Gospel of John. That's another subject that sometimes, for some reason, I get roped into. I guess I was walking too slowly down the corridor past the boss's office, I think. And so I got roped into lecturing on the Gospel of John, and it, oh, so I learned so much. I learned more than any of the students, I think, but don't tell them that. Because sending is a huge idea in the Gospel of John. Jesus is sent. Uh, he's sent to speak the word of God. That's in chapter 3. He's sent to do the will of God in chapter 4. He's sent to please the one who sends him in chapter 5. He's sent so that we can believe in the one who sends him. That's in chapter 6. It's chapter 11. That, that phrase is all over the place. Jesus is sent with the Father's presence in the Gospel of John. So the one who sent me is with me. That's in chapter 8. And the idea is everywhere in the Gospel of John. Such a, an important idea that Jesus is the one sent from God in whom we must believe. And now Jesus says to his disciples, so just the ordinary, common, garden variety Christians who are gathered there today, the, the people who are afraid, who are nervous, he says to them, as the Father sends me, so... I am sending you. Now that's, that's a pretty profound statement. As the Father sends me, so I am sending you. So we, are, we, all of us, all of you who are listening, me as well, we are sent the same way that Jesus was. See, I reckon it's really basic to being a Christian to recognize that Jesus is the one who sent. Isn't it? That's kind of how it works. God sends Jesus, okay? We believe that Jesus is sent from God. That's our main thing that we do in the Gospel of John. We believe that he's sent. Jesus sends us now so that we can point people back to him. I think that's what's happening here. God sends Jesus. We believe Jesus is a sent one. He sends us and we point people back to him. Just as Jesus pointed people to the Father, we point people to Jesus. And that's a big deal. I don't know how much you think about the fact that you are sent by Jesus or whether that's really something that's occurred to you before. But I think that's a really important concept to grasp. I know that when we talk about mission, a whole bunch of people usually think, oh, that's something that somebody else does. But I don't think you can get away with that when you talk about sending, because of the way it works. You know, if we believe that Jesus is the one sent by the Father, and then we read this where he sends us, and we say, nah, that's, no, no thanks. I'll just take the, you know, sitting down quietly option. I'll take the back seat. I'm not, I'm not one of those sent people. If that's how we think, do we really believe Jesus at all? Because he's the one who's saying this. And so if we don't accept what he's saying, do we actually accept him at all? So I think there's a real problem if people get in this frame of mind where they say, oh yeah, Jesus is definitely the one sent from God, but I'm not going anywhere, I'm not sent anywhere, that's not me. I just don't see how you can read this and think about what it means and, and make that work. I, I just don't think that works in this passage. So we are sent... It says here, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So that we sent now the same way that Jesus was. We're sent to speak the will of God. We're sent to do the work of God. We're sent to please the one who sends us. We're sent to, so that others can believe in the one who sends us. And we're sent with the presence of God as well, which is where it's heading in the next verse. Because in the next verse, verse 22 with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So maybe you're like me, and the idea of sending is a bit daunting. It was for us too. 
That's, I think, why we go straight into verse 22. With that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So that the gift of the Holy Spirit is something that all Christians receive, and it's part of being sent. It's part of God's presence being with us as we go. Now, it's interesting here that Jesus breathes on people, uh, perhaps not recommended at the current point in time to breathe on lots of people. But back then, I guess it was okay. And that's what Jesus did. And again, I don't think that's an accident that the spirit was imparted through breathing. Uh, first of all, because the words spirit and breath, they're all actually related in the original languages. It's the same kind of idea, spirit and breath. But secondly, if you've been around church for a while, this should be ringing a few bells. Because there was another time, some time before this, where somebody got breathed on. I wonder if you can remember what that was. Well, I won't ask you to show hands because obviously that's not going to work. But I'm sure that some of you are thinking of Genesis chapter 2. So in Genesis chapter 2, God breathes on Adam, breathes life into him. So he makes Adam out of the, out of the mud, out of the clay, out of the dust. And then he breathes on Adam in Genesis chapter 2. And obviously that's a pretty important, pretty, you might say, pretty important part of the Bible where you know, people are animated, as it were, people come alive. So think about that. Because what Jesus is doing here, I mean, he could have done anything. He could have just waved his hands at them. He could have sort of wafted it on them from a distance. But he chose to do this. And I reckon that's because what happens here in John 20 is as momentous as what happens in Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, where people come to life, as it were, what happens here in John 20 where they receive the Holy Spirit is as momentous, as important, as significant as Genesis chapter 2. It's a really profound moment. Not an accident, I reckon. There's also another place, a pretty famous vision in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 37. Uh, Ezekiel sees a valley of dry bones and in the vision the bones come back to life and the Spirit of God breathes on them and they become alive. And that's, at that point, that's talking about the people of Israel and their return from exile. They were dead in captivity, as it were, but God's going to breathe life into them. So I think maybe that's in the background of this whole breathing thing as well. So what's happening here with Jesus giving this spirit is as important as the actual creation of people or as important as the recreation, if you like, of the nation in Ezekiel chapter 37. This is huge. It's so deep and so profound and really a, a really a personal thing too, isn't it? That, you know, to breathe on somebody, you have to get up pretty close to them, much closer than, well, certainly a lot closer than we should be now. So it's both profound and it's very personal. And it's all of the disciples who receive the Holy Spirit. It's not just, you know, like the elite, as I mentioned before, the Olympic squad of disciples for whom this is. This is for everybody. Christians receive the Holy Spirit. From Jesus. So again, another sign I reckon that this is for all of us. Peace, joy, the gift of the Holy Spirit, those are things that describe all followers of Jesus. Not just a few people, describes me and you as well. And then we get on to verse 23. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That's a bit odd, isn't it? It's a bit unusual. There is another part of the Bible that's similar to that and another day we'll look at that one. What's going on here? How is it that the disciples have the ability to forgive sins? Isn't that something that really only God can do? Well, there's lots of different explanations of that, lots of different explanations and it goes on for pages and pages. But here's the one that made sense to me, the one that I remember and maybe it'll be helpful for you. What I reckon is going on here is that the Father sends Jesus, okay? And Jesus points people to the Father and we believe that Jesus is the one sent. Jesus sends us and we point people to Jesus and they believe in him who sent us in the Lord Jesus. And that's how their sins are forgiven, aren't they? Because they can't be forgiven if they don't believe so if we do our job in the power of the Holy Spirit, pointing people to Jesus, then they can be forgiven. 
But if we don't do our job and we just kind of, yeah, no, nah, not me. I'm not interested in that. I've got my ticket to heaven, thanks. I'll just kind of sit back and chill and wait for Jesus to come and get me. But I'm not into any of that sending stuff or pointing people to Jesus. Not interested. Well, when we think like that, then the people we're with won't hear about Jesus, will they? They won't know about him because we're not going to say anything. And so how will they know? And then they're not going to be forgiven because how can they be forgiven if they don't hear about him and don't know about him? So what I reckon is happening here is that we help people's sins be forgiven by pointing them to Jesus, by talking about him, by showing them what he's like. And if we don't do that, then their sins aren't forgiven. That's a pretty sobering way of thinking, isn't it? That's a pretty sobering way of thinking. That, not that I have the power to forgive sins somehow, because that's really only God that can do that. But I do have, in a sense, the responsibility to introduce people to the one who can forgive their sins. And if I ignore that responsibility, or if I don't want to take it up, or if I don't carry it out very well, then there's a way in which I'm actually preventing them from being forgiven. Of course, God can use other people, and he does. But it's on my head, isn't it, to be talking to the people I know about the one who can forgive their sins. So that's how it made sense to me. That's kind of what's happening in my mind. That's what I think verse 23 is saying. So we've covered a fair bit of ground here so far today. Verse 19 to verse 23, that's four verses. Not very many verses, but lots of big ideas in here. The reality of fear, which is part of the life of the disciples, not the first time they're afraid, not the last. If you have uh, doubts or anxieties or fears, you're not the only one. The presence of the Lord Jesus, bringing peace and resulting in joy. Bringing with him peace in the sense of the full sense of the word, not just the casual or salam alaikum sort of thing, but everything the Old Testament prophets look forward to and everything they meant, that's being dragged into this day to Easter Sunday. And then Jesus sending the disciples and giving them the Holy Spirit. So lots of really important ideas in this part of the Bible. Now maybe they're familiar to you. If you're already conscious that you have been sent by God to wherever it is, then that's great. You know, keep thinking that. And I hope this has been a useful reminder to you that wherever you are during the week and whatever it is that you're doing, that in some way God has put you there to accomplish his purpose. Uh, you're not there by accident. You're not there only because you want to be. You're not there just to pay the mortgage. You're not there just because you like it. But you're also there, maybe mostly there, because God wants you to be there and he sent you there. So if you're already thinking like that, then keep doing that. That's really good. And this is a good reminder for you. But if you're not up to thinking about that, then maybe this is the first time that you've thought that you could be part of what God is doing in the world, part of this big, scary thing called mission, then that's okay. That's great. Oh, I like it when that happens, when people realize that for the first time. You can see it happening in class. People, are, they lean forward a bit and they, they, their eyes widen. It's really, it's a, that's a good day for me. And I hope this is a good day for you as well. That if it's the first time that you've thought about God sending you, then that's a good thing. So what I want you to do now is uh, the opposite of what you're usually told to do in church. I want you to take out your mobile phone. Okay? And you might have to get someone to help you with this, but what I'm going to do and what I want you to do is set an alarm in your phone for Tuesday, let's say Tuesday at 2 o'clock, right? Because I don't know where you'll be at Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Uh, I haven't got a clue. But wherever you are, the thing is that you're there because God put you there. So put an alarm in your phone and have it go off at 2 o'clock. And when it does on Tuesday, look around you, wherever you are, and think, what's God doing here? What's happening here? How do I bring the Word of God into this place? How, how do I do the will of God in this situation? How is God equipping me? In it? What am I here for? What have I been sent to do in this place? So set your alarm for Tuesday at 2, and when it goes off, think about how God has sent you there in the same way that 
he sent Jesus. Now, I know that, well, I don't know what's going to happen actually this week. Nobody really does. It might be, it might be that you're not where you want to be on Tuesday afternoon. That because of the situation with COVID and all that, that you can't be well at work or at school or whatever it is that you usually do. And that is a, a disappointment for some people and a real nuisance for others. Uh, it's hard to see really any good out of all of this. But maybe one thing that could be useful is that because you can't go to the office or to uni or to school or whatever this Tuesday, you actually have a bit more time to think about not being there, but why you're there. Why has God sent you there? Do you see what I mean? So if, if the alarm goes off on Tuesday at 2 o'clock and you look at it and you think, oh, yeah, today's the day I would have been at work or in the office or, I don't know, out at Lawn Bowls or at the Model Railway Club or whatever it is. I wish I could be there, but I've got to stay at home. That's okay. Stay at home. There'll be another week to go. But use that to remind yourself to think, when I get back there, how might I be different if I realize and know and understand that God has sent me there. So not many good things have come out of COVID, but maybe there's the opportunity to do a bit of thinking. You know, we're all busy people. We all like to do so, all sorts of things, and there's nothing wrong with that, I suppose. But maybe one thing, useful thing, that could come out of all this is the opportunity to think about why we do things. So that when we go back, we go back as people conscious that we are sent by God. A couple of other things you might like to do. Uh, we've got a subject on evangelism principles. You're very welcome to sign up for that. And there's a really good book written by a guy called Lauren Crank called Unofficial Chaplain. Unofficial Chaplain. That's a, it's an easy book to read. We often give them out to students because it's such a, a useful and helpful book. So have a look for that, Unofficial Chaplain. Let me finish off by reading, reading again from verse 21, 22, 23. The words of Jesus to his disciples on Easter Sunday, the same words that he really says to us today, 2,000 odd years later. Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. With that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. How about I finish off by praying? Heavenly Father, thanks for the opportunity to read from your word today and to think about what it means. Thank you that you have a plan, you have a purpose, you have a mission, that you know what's going on. Although actually we don't, and there's you know a fair bit of chaos and confusion, particularly at the moment. None of this comes as a surprise to you, but you continue to carry out your eternal purposes in all the various ups and downs of this time in our history. So thanks that you're in control, Heavenly Father. You know what you're doing and you have a purpose, a plan. Thanks also that you include us in that. What a privilege and honour that is. You include us in your mission by sending us out. And so I pray for myself and the other people watching along today that wherever we are and whatever we're doing, we would have a growing consciousness that in that place and with those people, we are participating in your plan. You have sent us there just as you sent Jesus. We sent there to bring your word, to do your will, to bring the Holy Spirit into that place, to see what you're doing there and to cooperate with it, to help people, to love them, to get alongside them and to point them back to Jesus, the one who sends us. And so we pray all of this for his sake and his honour and his glory. Amen.
As we go out this week, may our, our hearts, our words and our actions be a response and a worship to our great God. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming online with us and joining us at our service. Please, please stay around and click on the link and join us for our Zoom morning tea. We'd love you to join us then. But as I close, I want to read these words for us from the book of Jude. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To to the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. See you next week.